Hi, my name is David Tici. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine, and a physician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'm also the chair of the Acute Lymphoplastic Lacoma Disease Committee in the Children's Oncology Group. Today, I'm going to talk about some key clinical trials for the use of blenitumumab in children and young adults with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Based on the results of some of these recent trials, blenitumumab is commonly being used across the globe in many patients with BALL and is becoming the standard of care in the United States for most children and young adults. And this is based on the results of some pivotal studies that have recently been published. Blenitumumab is an immunotherapy. And immunotherapy is the type is a cancer drug that works kind of like the same way that our immune system does. And this is a bispecific T cell engager, which basically links CD3 positive T cells to CD19 positive B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia blasts, brings them together so the T cells can attack and kill the B cell blasts. The data that have led to its recent FDA approval include a number of trials. The first was that of Europe by Locatelli and colleagues that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. This was a study in high-risk first relapse that was open at 47 centers across Europe. And on this trial, 108 patients were randomized to receive chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus one cycle of blenitumab. This trial was stopped early for efficacy, showing an improvement uh, in, the, in outcomes and a decrease in the number of events in patients with high-risk BALL from uh, 57 versus 31% comparing the two arms. The second was the ALL 1331 trial. Similarly, this was also a trial for first relapse of BALL in children. It was a randomized trial for the children's oncology group. Patients were risk stratified into a higher risk group and then a lower risk group. The higher risk group was randomized to receive two cycles of blenitumumab after intensive chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone on both arms followed by a transplant. These data were published by Pat Brown and colleagues in JAMA in 2021. 208 patients were randomized in this study, similar to the one I mentioned from Europe, was also stopped early for efficacy and low toxicity. On this trial, the two-year disease-free survival was 39 versus 55% comparing the two arms. The low-risk arm was also included on this, and for this, patients were also randomized to receive blenna versus chemotherapy two cycles after reinduction. The difference was they didn't go to transplant. They went to maintenance chemotherapy, and these data were published by Hogan and colleagues in the Journal of Clinical Oncology showing an improvement for your disease-free survival from 50 to 61%. Importantly, on this trial and on other trials of blenitumumab, it primarily benefited those with marrow involvement, and patients on that trial with isolated extra liturgy relapse had dismal outcomes. Based on these two results in these two trials and a relapse, there's been uh, two randomized trials recently published in New England Journal this year in children and adults. The first is the E1910 trial, which was in newly diagnosed adults. It was a phase three trial for patients age 30 to 70 with bcr able one negative BALL. They received induction, and they were also randomized to chemo versus chemo plus blenitumab. And on this trial, they were randomized to receive up to four cycles. It started out being for MRD-positive patients only, but then was changed to include MRD-negative patients. The MRD-negative patients were recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Litzow and colleagues. They randomized 224 MRD-negative patients and for median follow-up of 43 months. The three-year overall survival was 68 versus 85%, and the three-year U.S. survival was 64 versus 80%. And the last randomized trial I'd like to talk about is the ALL1731 clinical trial. This was a trial that was chaired by Sumit Gupta and Rachel Rao. It was presented in the plenary session at ASH this year in December of 2024, and also published simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine in December of 2024. This trial treated children with NCI standard risk B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This is ALL that's defined as age less than 10 and white count less than 50,000. Patients are risk stratified based on MRD response, disease biology, and CNS status of diagnosis. There were 4,000 patients risk stratified. The most favorable patients were treated with chemotherapy alone. And the highest risk patients in the study who have excellent outcomes still were non-randomly assigned to blenitumumab. There were approximately 1,400 children who were randomized to receive chemotherapy versus chemotherapy intercalcated with two cycles of blenitumumab. 
Patients were broken up in the randomized cohort into standard risk average and the standard risk high based on expected outcomes, um, based on disease characteristics. The overall three-year disease-free survival was 87% on the control arm versus 96% on the arm that received blenitumab. And at the standard risk average patients, it was 90 versus 98% three-year DFS. And for the standard risk high patients, it was 85 versus 94% disease-free survival. The benefit was in a reduction of marrow, but not CNS relapses. Uh, this trial has really changed the standard of care and frontline of BALL and the way we think about BALL is some of the average risk patients in this trial did as well as our most favorable risk patients. This trial was closed early because it passed its inter first interim analysis, looking at efficacy of only 40% of events. The final one to mention is the one randomized trial not to mention today, and that was an infants published by van der Sluis in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2023. Infants with ALL have a dismal prognosis. This trial treated 30 infants uh, with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and they gave a single cycle of blenna with the interfont chemotherapy backbone. And that trial had a two-year disease-free survival of 82% versus an expected 50%. At ASH this year, there was also a number of studies in pH positive ALL or BCR ABLE1 ALL showing the e efficacy of combining blenitumab with tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors in chemo light to chemo free backbone, showing pretty impressive outcomes in patients who used to have a dismal disease outcome, but with a combination of immunotherapy plus a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, many of these patients may be curable without any chemotherapy whatsoever, with the exception of some medicine directed at the CNS. This is made between these studies. Blenitumab is now arguably the standard of care in most children and adults with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. While it wasn't studied in NCI high-risk patients of BALL in a randomized trial, based on the results in infants, standard risk BALL, adults with BALL, and in relapse, in our opinion, patients of NCI high-risk ALL also should be treated with blenitumab. There's a lot of questions for the future. Which patients are most likely to benefit from blenitumab? We currently risk stratify patients based on disease biology, but the patients who are likely to respond to chemotherapy with or without radiation may be very different from the patients who respond or don't respond when blenitumab is added into therapy. We also don't know the number of cycles to give. As I mentioned before, all those trials gave between one and four cycles. We don't know the optimal length of cycles of blenitumab. There's been some studies coming out, some presenting at ASH, suggesting that two weeks of blenitumab may be better than four weeks because of impact on T-cell exhaustion. <clears throat> blenitumab does not cross into the CNS. So as we're using more blenitumab and taking away more chemotherapy, it's important that we make sure that patients don't have more CNS relapses and we give appropriate prophylaxis to the CNS. Um, and we really don't know the impact of giving blenitumab in the front line on what that will do to blenitumab responses and relapse. Ultimately, though, I think we're entering a new era where we're going to be starting to replace more and more immunotherapies of chemotherapy and hopefully enter an era over the next 5 to 10 to 20 years where patients with BLL can be cured without chemotherapy at all. Thank you.